Now we step into the shoes of a seasoned property guru whose journey began some 30 years ago as a facility manager in the very heart of London, laying down a really deep foundational understanding of the practical aspects of property operations. Over the years, he's transitioned from facility consultant to a strategic role here in Dubai in 2008. His expertise blossomed to encompass all facets of property management, from acquisitions and lease negotiation to project management and closeouts. His geographical canvas spans significant regions around the globe, with Dubai always serving as his strategic outpost. He's the trusted partner of giants like Visa and MasterCard and now Boeing, proving time and time again that his core focus is providing safe and productive and sustainable spaces for all staff and causing minimal impacts on the environment at the same time. Beyond his professional pursuits, our guest embraces an active lifestyle, relishing in the thrill of triathlons, not just for competition, but to enjoy the experience and maintain a healthy balance in life. Get ready as we jump into the fascinating world of end-to-end -end property management with none other than Martin Harris from Boeing. Welcome to the podcast, sir. What a great pleasure it is to have you here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so for those of you that aren't so familiar with you, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and explaining a little bit about how you made it to Dubai and what your career looked like before this point. Okay. So my name is Martin Harris. I work in corporate real estate generally, currently working for Boeing, but I've also worked for MasterCard and Visa uh, and Parsons, who are a construction management company, um, and, and various others um, in the Middle East. In my time, I came through facilities management in London. I was there from, I would say, 1994, 95 onwards, and kind of fell into it by accident almost. I, I was doing various temp jobs and ended up in a facilities department. And this was in the time when people weren't sure what facilities management was. Yeah. So uh, I ended up with facilities management on my CV. Um, there was a role came up and somebody said, are you a facilities manager? To which I said, yes, mm -hmm. I should have said no, <laughs> if I was being honest. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I kind of learned on the job. It was a great opportunity, a, a very nice uh, company managing several buildings in central London. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in 2000 and, uh, 2008, when I came to Dubai, and there was a, an opportunity presented. So, uh, yeah. Hands. Yes. And, and <laughs> I would just like to say that the global turned down in uh, 2008 and my arrival in Dubai, not connected in any way at all. <laughs> honest. Just wanted to live the tax-free sunny life. Well, it was the sunny more than anything else yeah, that, yeah. that got me. So yes, and of course, Dubai has changed so much in those sort of I don't know, fifteen years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the infrastructure has changed. The development has changed. Everything is going digital now. Um, you know, those were still in the days where you, if you were going to uh, written by a car over five years, you had to write out sixty checks wow. to be deposited every month and so on. So. You had to physically write out 60 checks. Jeez. So nowadays, thankfully, things have uh, improved dramatically. And I'm sure we'll continue to yeah. uh, head in that direction. So, yes, all good. Yeah, it's, they're making it really difficult to leave. Uh, yes. Well, I, th I think everybody else in the world is making it really difficult to want to leave. Yeah, so, or to uh, want to go there. Well, quite. Yeah. You know, I, I do go home to uh, the UK and Scotland uh, not as regularly as I'd like. Uh, when you're there in the first week, everything is great. The air is fresh. It's a sensible mm. temperature. You get the odd rain shower now and again. And then after two weeks of solid rain, you think, you know what? I'm good to go back to yeah. Dubai. It reminds you why you're here. So yeah. it's um, it's nice, but this is definitely the place to be. So so touching on what you were talking about there ever so briefly, you were talking about kind of the evolution of facility management really mm. behind the scenes. So if, you, if we kind of go back to the 50s, it was that role was more like an elevated janitor's role at that time. Yes. And then it kind of progressed as the facilities got more complicated and more cumbersome to figure out and, and find functionality mm. there. Uh, and then now what I'm seeing is this evolution again of facility management to less about the facility and more about those that dwell within that facility, they're becoming community managers. But that's not happening to the same degree here as I understand it. In other regions around the world, you can throw a stone and you hit like 10 community managers. Here, like I haven't seen that job title yet, but is it is it changing in the role, but not yet on the title yet? I'd love to get your opinion. Well, I think, you know, it started out as being, you know, something that nobody really wanted to do. It was dealing with the lease, it was dealing with cleaners and security and all these kind of things. And it, it tended to be the boss's PA who did that. And of yeah. course, um, that varied hugely depending on the size and complexity of the, the premises. Now, 
there's a huge uh, kind of compliance and legislative requirement on that. Uh, there was an incident in Barrow and Furness where somebody, in order to save money, um, didn't service the air conditioning units, which ended up with Legionella being there. And unfortunately, <laughs> next door was an old people's home, a retirement home, and there was a few fatalities. And it was all traced back to this. So the compliance aspect of it is, is very important, um, as well as um, keeping the staff safe and in a working environment and being productive mm -hmm. and i think you're right it's absolutely moved away from the the hard and soft services division um of being you know the bricks and mortar and then all of the, the soft services on the other side um to then uh come to a more customers facing kind of role so your clients and staff are now are, are now clients rather than your colleagues and it's um something that's um it, it is evolving, and you're right. Dubai tends to be um, on some things like this, it shows slightly behind the curve. Um, but it's, it's definitely you know coming. I mean, I know that there are communities in Dubai. You know, some of the big developers do have community managers who are who are essentially running that. But it's more from a, a maintenance perspective rather than the the tenants and uh, and so on. But yes, you, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And of course, in like serviced office companies, co-working, those sorts of facilities, mm. they do have those titles of community managers because it is, you know, the, the people that are using that space are the clients. They are, you know, yes. not the employees of the business. They are the clients. And I, I quite often challenge some of the clients that I work with. Uh, so people who are in a similar position to you to say, you know, if your office was to turn into a co-working facility tomorrow, how many people would pay for the privilege to come in? And the answer is quite often, well, absolutely nobody, because we haven't designed it to meet people's needs. It's a, a one size shoe fits all that, you know, mm. th th is definitely not in my size. So Yes. Well, and I think there's, there's been an evolution in the workplace. And I think flexible working in serviced offices and, and these, the we work, if you like, is a typical example. Yeah. Um, they Other have co-working facilities are available. available. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, the yes, executive yes, yes. centre has one option. Uh, uh, space. Yes. <laughs> yes. So th there's there's... there's more and more of these turning out. The, the best um, facility that I saw uh, was in the UK, where it was also being used as a disaster recovery site. Wow. So flex working, you know, people would come and go, but if somebody invoked their disaster recovery policy and needed to shift all their staff off site, mm -hmm. they were uh, they had space available in order to farm these people in. Okay. Um, and it, it was great because they were charging twice for the same desk, so it was being you know, held on a retainer for somebody for the disaster recovery site, as well as people coming in periodically to utilise it. Uh -huh. So that was that was something I hadn't considered before. But yes, it was a, it was a very good um, uh, use of that um, space. So yeah, and of course, you know, no, nobody wants to invoke their disaster recovery plan. Yeah. Um, and especially, it's, it it tends to be industry specific as well as uh, geographical. So. The, my experience with that was with our call centre in Croydon, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that we faced, there was um, probably three or 400 staff, um, but there was a power cut. And of course, without phones, a call centre is entirely useless. So um, the CEO made a very quick decision to you know, pull everybody, bus everybody to Crawley, um, which isn't far away, but it's far enough. Um, into this facility where uh, they had desks and phones and we supplied them with our disaster recovery box which had pens and paper and all the kind of um, stuff that the um, service provider wouldn't provide mm -hmm. uh, and set them up and off and running. So that uh, thankfully it only lasted three or four hours but it was still, you know, three or four hours in a call centre is a whole stack of phone calls yeah. for various clients and organisations. Yeah, that's really interesting. I can't help but wonder whether something as innovative as that would be applicable for the Mondays and Fridays that we're now struggling to lure people into the office for because we need to repurpose those spaces. I mean, yes, you can condense the floors and start turning off lights and electricity, but you've still got like redundant real estate there that we yes. need to find a use case for, right? Yes. Um, so what has been your experience, uh, maybe not necessarily at Boeing, but what you've seen there with some of your peers that are that are out there in the market as well? Um, well, I think before the pandemic, you tended to be a one-to-one um, -one desking system. Um, staff and senior staff weren't very happy to have flex working. So um, there's almost a mentality of, you know, if you're not 
if I can't see you, then you're not working or you might not be working. So we need to have you in the office all the time, as well as the um, interactive and collaboration aspects of that. Mm -hmm. So that was pre-pandemic, um, which I, and the office occupancy tended tends to be around sort of 60, 65 percent or so mm. um, in that sort of one to one desking. And even at peak um, usage where I don't know, there's a VIP visit or an all staff meeting or something like that. It's it never, never has 100 percent. Never has 100 percent. There's always somebody sick or on holiday or yeah. traveling or on client site or, or whichever. Mm. So that concept was was never fully engaged. And also, if you can save, you know, a fraction of the rent, um, the the income that you'd save against that and the perception that we're downsizing because you know something's going on the negative impacts of that far outweigh any uh, cost yeah. savings you might make so generally speaking it was done the, the most common response i got when i showed you know empirical data that of the 10 desks you have six of them are occupied uh, most of the time and the, you can lose the other four yeah and you show the data and the savings and so on and that was the, the response would be that's a brilliant idea for other departments to implement. My yeah. guys need a desk, you know, yeah. and, and that was true across the board. Um, so yes, and, and then post pandemic, of course, everybody had to work from home and lo and behold, the organizations didn't grind to a halt because yeah. nobody's in the office. And now that people have gotten used to working from home, me included, um, you don't have a commute, you can, you work in your PJs, you can do all, all kinds of um, stuff as well. You tend to be more productive. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning is you know, switch on my computer and have a look at emails. And of course, last thing before I go to bed at night is again, you know, have a look at my emails. So your day is way beyond your normal mm. eight hours, but it's fractured in different ways. It's it makes more productive, but that's not a long term thing. It's a bit like the you familiar with the Hawthorne effect, where people so the Hawthorne effect. Hawthorne was a company in the states, pardon me, who manufactured uh, telephones, and their stamp. This would be the 1950s or so, and their management wanted to see what changes they could implement in order to improve productivity. So they um, changed the working day and made uh, more breaks, but shorter breaks and mm -hmm. productivity went up. Okay. And then they uh, changed the lights and they made it brighter in the office and productivity went up. Um, and they changed the, the heating and cooling, so they made it cooler in the office and productivity went up. They then made it warmer in the office and productivity went up. They then gave them longer and fewer breaks and productivity went up. And what was the Hawthorne effect is that people know they're being studied, yeah. so they'll respond to that stimulus. But it's a short term thing. Over time you come back to the yeah, yeah. back to the average. So that that effect is is true of working from home. People have done that spike, you know, this is enforced upon us, we have to work from home in one of these things. Mm. But it's not a sustainable uh, output or studies would show that it's not a sustainable output. Yeah. And of course the collaboration and ideas generation, especially you know, creative people, um, you need to be in that sort of environment. Yeah. So uh, it's it's very much a, um, it's it depends on your role. So my current role, I only deal with a couple of people in Dubai itself. All of my other regional customers are, are not mm. Dubai yeah. by definition. So it doesn't matter where I am, as as long as when I need to interact with people in the office, I I go there, which I do a couple of days a week. Yeah. Um, just to, you know, to be part of that, and also to see different faces and you know remind people what I am, how you know who I am, what I do, and so on. Yeah. So uh, yes, it's the evolution of the workplace needs to um, accommodate that, um, but we need to design for the the peaks rather than the average, because of course you don't want you know to downsize and have you know nice collaboration spaces and soft couches to then, you know, on a Wednesday when everybody's in the office, not having enough space for everyone to work. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's uh, that's how things have moved on. I can't help but think Boeing airplanes, a really good analogy for how to make sure that you've got enough bums on seats in an office. You know, take the airplane approach, right? So you've you've booked your seat, you, you've got a space in there, but then they over they overcommit to the spaces that are there. And sometimes, I think very rarely, people have to get bumped. But otherwise, mm. you can't be sending planes up in the air at 65%, um, you know, uh, occupancy yes. for extended periods of time and expect them to be profitable. Um, so that was just a, a natural analogy that I started yes. to think about when you were explaining to yes. me. And of course, now in the post-pandemic world, we're significantly more hybrid. So we have more of an opportunity to uh, share and co-share uh, dedicated seating areas for, for, for departments so that we do increase that occupancy. Um, but I think it's, it, it, 
it's a real struggle here, especially you know in some some regions there is visas per square foot as well that has to be taken into account. Yes. So are you seeing anything or hearing anything changing along those lines or ways that we can circumvent? Um, the, do you, can you recall the exact amount of square meterage or feet it was per visa that we have to I'm, do? I can't, to? I can't remember. And I think 16 square meters or something. It's, it's a number like that. So mm. and, and again, harking back to you know, 2008 when I arrived, yeah. um, you needed to have a, a workstation per employee. Yeah. So that that was how the visa per square foot uh, came about. And of course, there were companies who would just have an empty building full of desks with a plate on it saying this this is the workstation. Yeah. And you know when people were being um, audited or investigated or whatever to make sure everything was compliant, you know that that was sufficient. You just need somebody in the desk, and uh, you know all's good. So things have again have evolved. I'm I'm aware that this, especially in the free zones or my knowledge of the free zones, um, you, you can have more visas per square metre than perhaps you might. So there, there is a degree of flexibility in there. We uh, we had to look at our portfolio as any organisation should to see, is it is it the right size? Is it the right kind of setup? Mm -hmm. um, the offices we currently occupy have uh, three different um, eras of fit out. One <laughs> is probably 10 plus years old. The other one's maybe five or six. And the newer site uh, is... Uh, the new sort of uh, Boeing standard and, and okay. color palette and so on and, and looks fantastic. Um, so you know, with sit stand desks is one of the the biggest uh, changes between the uh, previous iterations and, and this one. Yeah. Um, and that's all to do with you know uh, you know keeping the staff happy and productive and unhealthy as well because sitting down all day doesn't do you any good. Yeah. And nor indeed does standing all day. So it's the transition between the two that makes exactly those right. um, working. But again, you know, not everybody wants to. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively tall, so I would probably set my desk two or three centimetres higher than a standard issue, you know, fixed desk, and then leave it at that mm. until, you know, if, if my back's getting stiff or I'm on a call, you know, raise it all the way up to the standing position. But th those kind of variations, uh, yeah. uh, certainly, um, and again, evolutions of space need to be catered for the type of work you do. I mean, you mentioned Boeing's a manufacturing site. Mm. You can't make planes if you're working from home. Yeah. You've got to be there, you know, actually on the tools, doing the job and, and, and making your particular part. So that was another issue that, thankfully, I didn't have to address. I don't have any manufacturing in my portfolio. Uh, but yes, that was a, a huge issue. I think height, of, height adjustability is commendable because mm. there is a, a charge involved. It's a 15 to 20% premium from the traditional desk. But I think... Dubai in particular, because of the melting pot that we have with the, you know, the, the variations in nationalities, you know, we've got, you know, different, different uh, nationalities at different heights here, you know, Very much uh, so, yes. I'll, I'll not name them, but I think we can all, we can all think, <laughs> you uh, can visualize, uh, we can yes. visualize what, yes. what, what they are. Um, for me, what I'm also seeing with height adjustability is that it's a law to get people to come into the office as well. It's another bell ergonomic whistle, if you will, that they probably can't afford at home that they might then see as a, uh, an added benefit for coming into the office and a reason why I choose to dwell there to complete yes. certain tasks, yeah. Yes, I, I think the, the office space needs to be, um, I, th I think it's difficult to make an office attractive mm -hmm. and to make people want to come into it. I think that's uh, that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. I think n not making it unattractive is probably a, a, a target that would be you know nice to hit. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, the, the older aspects of it they have their appeal and there's lots of offices lots of square footage per person yeah. um whereas the newer sites are much more open plan but of course if several people are, all, are on calls then it starts to get a bit noisy and intrusive and so on so there's there's pros and cons in all sorts of layouts okay so what would you say is the most innovative out of your new facility that you worked on besides the height adjustable desks um I'm, to be honest i i quite liked the uh, thought of the so the eating area as also being a potential meeting space as well. So the dual use of uh, areas um, and also how you lay out uh, an enclosed office um, can be uh, useful as to um, when it's occupied, it's a one person office, but when it's unoccupied, it can be a four or five person meeting room and you, you need to lay it out in such a way that it's not obviously one nor the other. Yeah. Um, so that uh, if the incumbent is happy with that, um, and then it's okay. So I think you know, having an allocated office is one thing, but that having a, a locked cubicle for all of your stuff and a, and a clear desk policy at the end of the day as well yeah. um, it certainly helps. I think having the uh, capability of 
using an office for multiple uh, functions is is great. But for the the canteen, I really like those little uh, kind of 1950s restaurant booth type things with the acoustic paneling around the outside. So um, they're they're great to work in. Mm -hmm. um, Any tech in there to help well, them double up as collaborative spaces? We we tried. We did think about that, and then we thought we wouldn't put in uh, power because then people would just occupy them all day. That camp. Exactly. So if, if you have a laptop that's got a you know two or three hour runtime on its battery, then that's the limit of your time to sit in that particular space. Mm -hmm. So they're meant to be drop-in areas, but by implication, there's a drop-out as well. Yeah. <laughs> you can also do it with furniture. So you can provide the power and then just give them something hard to sit on. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. I'm, I'm 38, but still, you know, if I'm on a hard wooden surface, I've probably yes. got like maybe half an hour to an hour before I'm going to... Yes. Mosey on down somewhere else. <laughs> well, we, we, we did uh, implement a, a standing meeting room. Yeah. So, we, so we had a bar height table uh, and a presentation thing. We actually uh, had grass, as or fake grass as a carpet, oh. which people really quite liked. They thought it was... A bit of grounding. Of, yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that just made the room feel very different. And yeah. of course, the first thing people say when you move in is, but there's no chairs. And you go, yep. So make your point, make it brief, <laughs> make it sensible, and then you know, bail out. And and did it have an effect on the duration of meetings? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I so I've seen that in the data, that it, it brings it down to like half an hour. Uh, yeah, yeah, easily. And, mm. and of course, you tend to have smaller meetings because the, pe the hangers-on that don't really need to be there don't want to be standing for half an hour either. So unless you really need to be there, then it does you know uh, trim the numbers down. Yeah. But I, I use that... Um, quite a lot in, in my time it was actually with uh, with Visa uh, and those, that was the standard room that I, I went to not everybody was a fan yeah. but it did you know uh, trim the um, all the fat off the discussions and meetings and so on uh, so yes I, I, I like that concept and of course it had to be soundproof as well just to uh, you know uh, just to you know keep it um, confidential from people over uni so going back to the the private space you're kind of almost doing a halfway house between where I think other regions of the world are going in terms of instead of privacy as a luxury, it's privacy on demand. There's a lot of employees yeah. that have a very real need to do heads down, focus, uninterrupted work. Yep. But let's say that they're in an open plan environment and that's just not possible for them. So they end up working longer or staying late or just being uninterrupted you know, interrupted, um, frequently. Yeah. So being able to access a private space is a real need for, for loads of people, regardless of their seniority. So what you have, or what you've described to me, at least I'm just double checking, confirming with you, is that when that senior person isn't in there, then other people can access that space. Correct, yes. That's, that's, that's a great yes. first step, isn't it, really, to, to help people like have more privacy in the office and yes. to get better occupancy of those spaces. Because hmm. I remember from the data in my previous company, private offices are unoccupied 77% of the time. Yes. So why, why are we providing them for, for senior people? Yes, and because again, there's it's egos. That's the, what I'm thinking. Well, <laughs> yes, the, there is a there is a mentality that the more important I am, the bigger space I have. I mean, um, it, I've I went to visit a, a landlord, um, and I, I wasn't speaking to him directly. I was speaking to his lawyer, and his lawyer had the second top floor uh, of the, the, this tower, um, and it was. It was a huge space, and there was his desk and his own private washroom, a little gym, his PA sat outside, but he, he only had half the floor. The other one was the CFO or someone of, of that nature, but the owner had the whole penthouse suite as his office. It was the whole floor, um, because obviously, you know, if he's pitching or selling or whatever and brings clients in, mm -hmm. they need to know that he's the important guy, so he has a big office. So um, th the perception of that is uh, is a very... Um, and was it regional or even country by country um, type of um, approach that you need to look at. So uh, it was um, Japan Toyota were famous for getting rid of all offices. Their CEO sat in the corner at a workstation with everybody else, which has got to be hell on earth for the guy who gets to sit next to the CEO. But, you know, that's uh, that was entirely acceptable. Yeah. That wouldn't fly in numerous other countries elsewhere. So th these are the sorts of... Um, uh, cultural and, and perception issues that you need to be cognizant of mm -hmm. and sympathetic to when you're designing space. So, okay. like I said earlier, you know, uh, unless the employee's right there, then they might not be working. That, I think that mentality has diluted a lot, mm -hmm. but there's still a degree of, um, you know, my team need to be, you know, within earshot at least. Okay, and and that brings me to my next question. Very nicely, Martin. Thank you, sir. Um, how do you? Obviously, you have 
and I'm sure at MasterCard and Visa, in fact, I know very well that you did, uh, and at Boeing, you'll have had global standards, but how do you implement the local differences and the nuances for the, for the, for the regional teams that need to be taken into account? Because I work with many organizations that just, it, it doesn't matter, it's a blanket. They don't get any regional say whatsoever. This is mm -hmm. what we're doing, and of course, inevitably that ends up being a terrible project for the employees uh, who then move into that space and it costs them more time. So how can you make sure that you get those nuances from that global plan? Well, I think global standards are a great idea. Um, and I think the, it, it reduces the, um, the discussions where employees might visit another office and go, hang on a second, why have they got all this stuff and we don't? Mm. Does that um, parity across the board that everybody's got approximately the same kind of stuff. Um, we did have uh, um, ply global plans which had, you know, with, with regional variations. And um, any global standard should have, you know, uh, uh, selections. It shouldn't be a hard and fast, well, in my opinion, it shouldn't be a hard and fast, this is the standard, therefore you must stick to it. Mm -hmm. it's, you, it's, you can have metrics which make sense. So workstation size, for example, the office size, depending on your seniority um, and so on. If there's so many people in the office, then you need a large meeting room as well as several small ones and phone booths and so on. So all of those kind of uh, 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 metrics should be um, it should be hard and fast, to be honest. Unless, of course, there's you know, demand for a, a training room, for example, you need a 40-seater amphitheater just to, to fulfill a particular need in a particular office. That's a deviation and that's fine. But as far as the regional variances go, there's to yeah, color and design and some layout and some, some aspects of it, but it can't be a, a complete uh, you know, detraction from the standard. The standard still needs to be applied. Mm. Um, and again, it, it depends very much on the local leadership and their relationship with you know, senior leadership at the head office. You know, if they can argue the toss and say, yeah, you know, this might be the global standard, but we need something from that, then deviations are, you know, signed off, thankfully, well above my level. Um, or, uh, all of my organizations, you know, these um, types of discussions were on. So, uh, and again, depending on the, the job itself, you may require, you know, two monitors or even three monitors, you know, legal one, one letter as well as one uh, portrait and so on. So these variations depend on the roles and the tasks of what's going on. So a sales office will look very different from an R&D office yeah. and, and so on. So if money, budget, red tape and approval were non-issues, what initiatives would you like to implement? Oh, what gosh. are you seeing that's out there in, in, the, in the market that you see like some of your peers doing, you're like, oh, I'd love to do that, but I'm just never going to get it off the ground or we don't have the budget for it right now. Um, to be honest, I, I think we're doing pretty well so far. Okay. I think the the uh, the opportunities to uh, set things out, we we still need to remember that you know it, this is an office. It's not a, a a kind of playpen or a work a, a kind of play school. Um, we do need to have you know various standards and things that allow people to work the access to quiet space, like yeah. you said, the phone booths and so on. So I think within those parameters, there's a limited number of things that you can do. There's a, a couple of cool things that I've seen, uh, one of which I did implement was a living wall. So you have uh, basically a waterfall um, covered in plants and a trough at the bottom, and it just recycles all the water through and they have the daylight lamps on it as mm -hmm. well. Th that was fantastic and uh, that really went down well. Um, I think as far as technology goes, or um, and, th and this is a sort of a general comment, visitor management is still um, fairly basic. So in some companies you go in, they'll hand you a book and you get to sign and fill in your name and so on. But of course you can then look at who's been in in front of you and say, oh, you're also pitching to these clients as well. That's good to know. Mm. So the, the tech part of that, there was a company that I uh, spoke with and not so long ago, who had a, a great system where you only needed your uh, cell phone number and your number plate. So it, it was a great system whereby you know the visitor signs in uh, and says, yes, I'm coming on this day at this particular time. As they approach the uh, car park barrier, it reads the plate and lifts it. It then sends the, guest, the host rather, an email to say, your guest is now in the car park. Um, so finish up what you're doing and get ready to come and greet them. They then go to reception. If you still needs to be a human interaction to check yeah. that you're actually who you say you are, um, and once you get to reception, your cell phone signal gets picked up, and the board changes from the um, generic stuff to you know, welcome Martin Harris, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, a nice touch. It, it then sends a note to the host again to say he's now in reception. If the host can't 
uh, attend for you to have a phone call or whichever they will say okay we're in meeting room B and it then sends your phone a note to say you're in meeting room B and it's, there's a blue dot to take you to meeting room B which and all of that tech is is fantastic but it's the, trying to get it to integrate to company systems and the I, the um, no IP what do you call it the uh, personal information um, aspect of things GDPR, uh, yeah. GDPR thank you and the retention of data is is a huge uh, hot topic so mm-hmm. trying to get something like that implemented could take forever and of course it's not cheap yeah very nice but not cheap and staying on the thread of prop tech uh, and, and what you're basically describing anyway but more uh, general for the employees and the occupancy and the utilization of spaces um, are you looking at that at the moment? Have you got any technology that you want to implement or currently implementing to just measure the the performance of the offices that you that you're overseeing? I did see a really cool um, article and a, uh, a video on YouTube of two gentlemen who were hazarding a word of caution around AI, and basically what they were highlighting is that through um, artificial intelligence and Wi-Fi routers, they were able to basically see through walls and determine who you know, not who like as me oliver you martin mm. in the room but the people and postures throughout the whole facility just using a wi-fi router so we don't necessarily need to buy any additional sensors although there are some great ones that do you know heat sensors mm. and um you know take snapshots of yeah. spaces and see signs of life and yeah. that sort of thing no i think ai is coming whether we like it or not but it's also one of these uh can double-edged swords it will have a huge benefit but will also um could be used for nefarious purposes like you say you know so being able to see through walls might benefit the organization but also it might uh it, you know can be used in uh in a darker um manner in fact i, I think I, I saw that uh wi-fi's um article as well yeah. but it's i think the i'm i'm still very much on the kind of the monitoring of space and how it's being used. Um, there was a system, and it's a few years ago now, where when you've booked your workstation, you put your cell phone onto a, a pad, it then registers you as being there, it then tells people that you want to know that you're there. Um, so that if if people see it pops up, oh, Martin's in the office, oh, I need to, I'm meant to go and see him about that thing, they know where to find you. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that was a, a useful thing. It also happily charges your cell phone as well. Um, I think the 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 tech of we're, we could be moving away from laptops as being the standard because your phone is is powerful enough. So your phone can plug into a monitor, and if you have a mouse and keyboard, then you you don't need to be lugging a laptop around all the time. So th- these are the kind of evolutions which again it's a, the perception of working from your phone rather than having a physical laptop that that does need to change. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also convinced that the desk sizing that we have today's 160 180 is far too big those were designed in the days of crt screens and and desktops so the space that we actually need rather than space that we'd like to have you know can be much much smaller than that Mm -hmm. but of course then you're into proximity and intrusion and you know overhearing everybody and so on so there's uh, there's there's ways and means but uh, that's the big issue is is proxemics because you know you're right we laptops are really small now phones are even smaller you could go down to you know, one meter, and I've seen some people implement that, but then, you know, the degree of comfort. So, like, we know each other relatively well, so this is a fine dis- distance. We could even come a little bit closer, and we'd both be fine with that. Yeah. Uh, here might be a little bit too much, right? <laughs> those, are, those are reserved for intimate relationships. But, you know, with your colleagues, if you just started, that could be really intrusive for you. And if you're introverted versus extroverted, you know, taking yeah. in neurodiversity into account, there's so many different variables. But then I think that's when the the onus of choice comes in mm. and the freedom as opposed to just saying, right, Martin, you go and sit there, you know, work there. Yes. I have the freedom to choose where, where I, where I work and where I sit. And then I can choose the degree of space that's required based on how I'm feeling in that moment. Yes. And I guess also the, the, the task at hand, you mm. mentioned earlier about, you know, you need uh, isolated work. So there's you know, phone booths, which are small enough for, you know, two people or uh, a one-to-one you know, short one-to-one discussion mm. you know these kind of things are they're becoming far more affordable mm. they're also mobile they don't take up a lot of space you know so there is that degree of flexibility they're um, really popular oh, very much so especially post-covid now right yes yes mm. and i think the uh the, the ways of uh, or i think the way people would use them it can be uh um can change a lot so like you said lock, lock yourself in a little room and, and get on with the task at hand in an undisturbed manner or just have a, a soundproof 
booth in which to have your video calls or uh, or whichever. So um, yes, it's uh, there's there's so many different types of uh, layout and and fun things. You know, soft furnishings. Mm. I remember having um, you know a suggestion of a playroom for the more creative people to go and relax and chill out in. Um, I, Thankfully, that was overruled, you know, and we ended up with a. It was a. It was basically a library. We had a quiet library that that was called the quiet room, where you know, the the assumption was that when you go in there, you you don't want to be disturbed, nor do you want anyone to disturb you. Mm. So there were you know several people in the room, but no talking. I'm yeah. busy. I'm doing this. I'm focused. If you want to talk to me, wait till I've gone for a cup of coffee. Mm. So yeah, and it depends very much on the organisation what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve. You know, uh, and also uh, how important they've uh, deemed their staff to be. So, uh, yes, lo- lots of uh, oh, lots of choices there. Yeah. Well, I've had the pleasure of meeting you at different points in your career and my time in Dubai. I think our first interaction was when you were at Mastercard, I believe, and I was doing a presentation on on happiness in the workplace. If I recall correctly, I think you spoke to us earlier. I was at Visa, and, was you, Visa? and you spoke, and it was uh, Hayworth, uh, I think. Was it Hayworth? That you were with? And no, I was with uh, another furniture manufacturer. Another furniture manufacturer. <laughs> yeah, others are available. Yeah. Yes, plenty of others are available. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but yes, and it was uh, it was a very interesting talk, and, and I think that's why you know, we made contact and changed numbers and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, it's uh, that that type of um, I'm not going to say sales approach because it wasn't really a selling type thing. It was like your pitch started off, not your pitch your presentation started off with, you know, I'm not trying to sell you furniture. I'm just trying to, you know, put some ideas in your head as to what you can do. There's lots of solutions. Here's some of the ideas. And and that was a refreshing a- approach to things. So, uh, so yes, that's a- another way of, of doing it. Yeah. But of course, you would need to change that depending on which company you're talking to. Yeah, of and course. And their outline and requirements and so on. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've always been a big advocate and this is what I'm trying to encourage even more so now that I'm on my own um, is is just the surveying and sampling of employees you know Mm. it happens in other markets but it doesn't happen here because we're a little too hierarchical um, in in many industries and when you're hierarchical you tend to not care so much about what's happening on the lower levels Mm. but of course that's where all the value and economics is generated actually at some of the lower levels absolutely so it's really imperative that we do survey them Uh, and so that's what I'm always that's the backbone of pretty much every talk that I do Mm. is how can we survey and sample people to know what spaces people require and and even when I'm speaking at universities and this isn't really a fault of of the lecturers but I, we need to find a way around it. They they give the students a project, right? Here's a floor plan. This is for uh, a, a lawyer's office. Go and design a lawyer's office. Well, how can you design it when you, you don't have, like, the data from the employees who consume that space? Like, you could just have um, a load of paralegals, you know, that, you know, without anyone, you know, requiring that kind of dedicated private space. Mm. Um, so how do you know what space to design unless you've, like, sent out some surveys, run some workshops with them, and then you have a better idea of how to design that space? So... My question was really um, around like, what do you think we can do in the market to spread more awareness around like the workplace strategy and consultancy part that I think is probably being overlooked across mm. the region where we're a little bit more focused on the beautification of spaces mm. rather than actually like, are they meeting the needs of the people within them? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's there's definitely elements uh, of that. And if I just think about doing client surveys, I, I saw a, a reel recently, which was uh, back to the floor where you get the uh, TV series where they take the CEO and they disguise him and they put him down you know, down with the workers to find out what's actually going on. Mm. And then he gets a, 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 a true view of you know how things actually are as opposed to how he thinks they are. Because if you're surrounded by yes men, yeah. they're going to ask, is everything okay? Yes. You know, do we need to change anything? No. So th- that's the sort of... Uh, just a, a, a prime example of to, uh, you know, getting a, a survey out. I think the how you structure the survey, what's included, what's excluded, how anonymous it is, and, and so on. All of these factors uh, need to be considered. And, of course, that comes at a cost. And, you know, senior management, like it or not, are there looking at the profit and loss sheets. You've got to have a positive number. So how much is this going to cost me? What's the output? What's the ROI? Mm. All of these sorts of aspects come, you know, how long is it going to take to, to do that? Yep. And once we've got an answer that says we need to completely, you know, gut our uh, offices and change it, you know, entirely... What's that going to cost? Mm. And is there is there a, a payback on that? Well, you end up with happier, more productive staff. But, you know, 
is it going to uh, help the bottom line? And I'm sure there's, again, research that would say, yes, it does. Um, but um, yeah, trying to convince the guy who writes the checks is uh, possibly a different impression. Yeah, I, I actually had another guest, uh, Mick Todd from 2B Limitless. He's a uh, kind of a leadership and performance yeah. coach. And he was kind of explaining, uh, and this is from a, a, a gentleman called Sean Aker. He's at Harvard University in the States. Fantastic book called The Happiness Advantage. And he was a professor, and he still is a professor, and he was looking at the campus. He's just wondering, like, why... Why were the students not as happy as they should be? This is like one of the best universities like in the world, but it was the pressure that was weighing them down. And there's something called the Pygmalion effect, which is like the self-fulfilling prophecy that's at play as well. He also noticed that the medical students were the ones that were the most sick because they're the ones that are going through all the texts yeah. and self-diagnosing and then becoming a little bit like hypochondriac, you know, because yes. they're, they're, they're digesting this content all the time. So they're looking for it out in the world and on themselves. Um, so I, th I thought that was that was really interesting of, of of just how in the book it describes that if you want if you want more finances, focusing on more finances isn't, isn't going to get you more money. In the same way that if you um, uh, sorry to, to get happiness, if you want to get happiness, finances isn't going to get you there. But yes. if you focus on the happiness, then it gets you more finances in the long run. And if that's what you're focused on, is mm. just being more content, more happy with your life, then the rest of things kind of fall into place rather than just focusing on something that is outside of your control and extrinsic value, which is capital and, and money. Yes. Focus internally first is basically what, what yes. he was saying and what it says in the book. Was it not Richard Branson who said you should treat your staff like your customers? You know, if, if you don't treat them nicely, then you're not going to have any customers. That's right. So uh, you don't don't look at the end game, look at how they're achieving it. So it's, yeah. the, it's the how and, and mm -hmm. rather than the what. That's right, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're the number one customer is your employees. If you yes. look after them, they'll look after your number two customers, which is everyone else. <laughs> yes, yes. And he's done some phenomenally innovative stuff as well. Uh, you know, yes. Uh, over and, his time as an entrepreneur. But, and he's had numerous failures as well. But of course, he, you know, that's what he says. You know, every, every, every failure in the business teaches him a lesson as to how he's going to uh, you know, make the next one work. So every, every, every failure is you know, the next step to the big success. And of course, he's absolutely done that. Cool. Um, so going a little bit closer to home and kind of post-COVID changes, um, how are you seeing like the attitude from the C-suite changing in terms of having that kind of primary location? Because as I understand it, HSBC have moved out of Canary Wharf, Boeing, um, some changes have happened in Seattle and Chicago. Yes. Um, is that happening in other regions around the world? What is the sentiment shift that you're seeing? Um, I think during COVID there was a... Uh perception that we you know, needed to right size the offices just to make sure they're still fit for purpose uh, and of course the percentage utilization is very low um now that we're uh, on the other side of that there's there is um more of a desire to return to the office so returning to the office um in a, in a sensible sort of uh setup so like you said mondays and fridays tend to be very quiet and you know tuesday wednesday thursdays when everybody wants to come in everybody wants a, a long uh, weekend you know uh, and of course there's the four day week is is creeping in uh, as well but uh yeah and uh, you could argue the toss as to how productive people are in their their off time but looking at the uh, how the offices are being used um I, th I think like i said earlier we need to design for the peak um occupancy rather than the average but also when we look at taking out workstations and having more collaboration space that's pretty much the same kind of square footage that you need just in a different format yeah so there's no uh, it's a work point versus a workstation right e exactly yes and and the um i think the the idea that you could save huge amounts of money by you know not having no spaces uh, just hasn't come to pass as far as having the office in the prime location um I mean, relocating an office is, is not something you do lightly, especially something the size of, um, you know, Canary Wharf. Um, that was a, a huge decision based on how work has changed and, and, and so on. I mean, that, that building is, well, it's now, what, 25, 30 years old, something like that. The, uh, yeah, the connectivity isn't brilliant. You know, it's not bad, but it's not great. Um, it's all, all, there was lots of negative factors about that, you know, particular tower. Um, or... I'm assuming that was all, all discussed. And also people who can get into central London, they need to take another uh, train to get out to Canada uh, Wharf. So the um, 
the the key office in the prime location. It's that's a, a kind of double edged sword. You know, you don't want to have a phenomenal uh, a prime location tower because then all your customers are saying, "Well, now we know why your prices are so high." So if you can afford that, you can afford to reduce my prices. Yeah. You know, and but conversely, you don't want to have some uh, shack in an industrial site out in the middle of nowhere either. But um, so there, there's that balance to be struck, and it depends very much on who your clients are and, and where they're based, um, and also how how demanding they are. Mm. Um, I mean, within Dubai, um, Boeing is based in the the airport free zone as is Emirates and uh, uh, Fly, Fly Dubai as well. So those are the two biggest customers that we service from uh, this area. There's also you know, uh, DHL and all the other the freight carriers as well. So being based in DAFSA actually makes pretty good sense. Mm. Until you talk to the guys who actually manage those accounts and he says, so when were you last in the Emirates office? Oh, I've only been there once when I was introduced. And they've, they've come here or we've met off-site or we've done various other things as well. So the proximity is far less important, um, or at least the perception of proximity is actually less important than the perception of it is, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and of course, now we have the other airport, DWC, and Dubai South. All of that space is um, is en route and being developed. I think the uh, once the um, uh, connectivity goes in, so a, a metro line and various other things as well, you know, that space will you know uh, take up. It's a huge area, and uh, you know it does need to be uh, utilised better. So th these were the kind of discussions that we're having. But of course, the proximity to you know, uh, sorry, the commute to DWC would you know, be very inconvenient for a lot of staff. Now, you know, what's your attrition rate if you move offices, or not? How many people would want to go virtual, and so on? So there's lots of other impacts other than just the physical bricks and mortar and its location. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's like everything. You know, there's a balance to be struck, and it's finding that balance. Is it also a shift to where the talent might be? Because since COVID, like we saw lots of people like scurrying from central locations and cities, like. New York, London, you know, saw a mm. mass exodus and moving to more rural regions. Yes. So would it make more sense to have some more kind of satellite offices rather than central locations in your mind? Um, yes, I think having a hub and or spoke. Or is it co-working, you know, the, well, the supports? It, exactly. You know, the, the hub and spoke arrangement um, it does make sense in, in some uh, areas. I think Dubai is small enough that you, you wouldn't want to have a key office and then a, a secondary office is. I mean, I guess you can Dubai, you can drive end to end in what an hour, hour and a half, something like that. So it's it's not as as big as say you know London and all the conurbations round about that. I think especially in the UK, the the flight to the rural space was the idea that you know I know I need a garden if I'm going to be in the house all the time. I need fresh air, I need a garden, I need all sorts of things. However, now there's the return to the office. People are saying, well, I want all of that, but I also don't want a two-hour commute. Uh, on top of it, which adds four hours to your day. Yeah. So again, there's, there's a, a balance to be struck between those two. Mm. Well, Martin, that has flown by. That's gone by so quickly. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today? Um, well, I, I think you, know, you need to look at the office space and, and fit out as being um, much more than just buying furniture and fixtures and fittings. Mm -hmm. You talked about a survey involving, you know, involve the staff in the project uh, or you'll know, find out what they want. If, if they don't tell you what's wrong, then you can't fix it. So the, the, the communication and regular communication is key. And I also think that any suggestions that come in, um, any, any surveys need to have a sensible output because nobody wants to put their time and effort in to then just see their efforts disappear into a yeah. black hole. So the, the communication is, is key. But and yes. the an, 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 analytics. Anonymity. An, anonymity. <laughs> an, anonymity. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that nameless survey. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's something as well. But of course, staff are always highly sceptical about, you know, you, you've got um, you've got my IP address, you've got my station, you you, you know who's doing these things. So it, there needs to be a third party. That's what I was about to that. say. Always. Yeah. You can't send something out from HR, especially if it's like demonstrating how good HR are. <laughs> yes. And, and also, I mean, you can send something out from HR and expect a 100% a, a clear and honest answer. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so yes, you're right. Third parties is the way to go. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you being part of the podcast. You're welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Where?